Okay, welcome to the last in this series of expositions through rocks. We've already covered the types of rock, go and find it online, look up types of rock. The rock cycle, go and find it online, look up the rock cycle. And now what we want to do is cover the very basics of weathering. No more than the very basics. I'll do a, a much more complicated uh, video on, on the real intricacies of this, but I know for some people it's a bit scary. Okay, physical weathering chemical weathering, and then biological weathering, which, as you'll see, really is kind of a, an accelerant of physical processes and chemical processes. So here we go then, weathering. Physical, chemical, biological. The asterisks are for the students of mine that are doing the AQA GCC, just to show you which ones are needed, but I couldn't stop myself on the physical, and I did stop myself on the chemical. The biological, well, make your own conclusions in a moment. So let's go through these types of weathering. First of all, what do we know about weathering? Well, we know that weathering is the breaking down in situ of rock material. Very different from erosion. We're not talking about fluvial glacial or aeolian removal. We're just talking about the breaking down of rocks. Here's one way you can actually summarize this information. You can tabulate your notes or you can for revision. Exfoliation and freeze thaw are the key ones. But I'm going to talk about the other two quite briefly. Okay, first of all, physical weathering. All that happens with physical or mechanical weathering is that rocks are broken up into lots of fragments of exactly the same rock minerals. But of course, we do get a larger surface area. So it can accelerate the relative rates of chemical weathering, as we'll see later on. And we look at Mr. Louis Pelletier and his wonderful diagram. First things first, exfoliation, exfoliation. Just like exfoliating the skin off your heels, ladies, exfoliation is about removing layers. Exfoliation is very straightforward. Heating and cooling happens during the day and during the night, and it happens mainly on the external sections of a rock because, of course, they're exposed to the sun during the day and they cool down rapidly at night. So it's no wonder, therefore, that you're going to get parallel cracking or fissures developing around a rock, and then ultimately those bits will break off. Here's an example here of exfoliation in process. And you can see the very large planes that have broken off. Notice this is an igneous rock. So we're not talking about bedding planes or lines of weakness. These lines have purely been created because the forces of, of expansion and contraction act at equal depth. If you like, isolines could be drawn at, around your rock at equal depths because that's where the force of expansion and contraction occurs. It's quite a straightforward process, but very important on igneous rocks in particular. Second process, which you've probably met already, is freeze-thaw. Now, all physical weathering processes need water to be present, but this is the one where water and its change of state from liquid to solid does the damage. One little caveat about freeze-thaw weathering. Water, if it sips into a crack, and then just expands on cooling, it's gonna pop out of the crack. In the old days, we had things called milk bottles. And when you put your milk bottle outside in the winter, it would push out the aluminium cap. It wouldn't break the bottle because of course the path of least resistance to expansion was to break off where the little aluminium foil cap was. So just remember that the, the, the diagram you're gonna see in a moment is quite weak, but it explains the process. Second thing is, of course, you can pause me at any time and read what's being said down there, and you can read it to your heart's content. Most importantly, we call this type of weathering, just like exfoliation, a fatigue process, because when the, the water freezes, melts, freezes, melts, freezes, melts, that's just like applying the stress or strain to a, a plastic bar or a ruler. Eventually, you're going to set up failures in the rock because the rock can't expand and contract like plastic. It expands and contracts as a brittle substance. And as a brittle substance, it will eventually give. Those of you into your physics, look up hysteristics and Young's moduli. So there's an example of freeze thaw acting on a rock to shatter it. And here are the diagrams which you'll see reproduced in so many books. They're not wrong. They're just pretty basic. Okay. One little extra to give you because I like you. Water will expand and then at a much cooler temperature contract. We don't have to worry about that temperature because we don't get down there. We're talking about minus 18 degrees or more. But when water is constrained within a crack, the force it expands as uh, it pushes out against the sides of the rock is greater than the breaking strength of steel. So this process is very, very important. Of course, it's very important when you have multiple frequent oscillations around zero degrees. So not where it's very, very cold and not where it's very, very hot. You do the maths. 
Okay, I did mention I'd say two others. If we take the thermal expansion and contraction idea, but take it down to um, a polycrystalline rock, mm -hmm, many different types of crystal, they have different expansion coefficients. Feldspar, mica, and quartz, for example, in granite are, are dark, brown, and translucent. And because of the different expansions of coefficient, that sends up micro fissures in the rock, which can lead to breaking down of, especially uh, sedimentary rocks, can lead to sandstones, for example, breaking down as well as granites uh, very easily at a granular level. And that's why this one's called granular disintegration or sometimes thermal disintegration. And here is a hieroglyphic laden tombstone from uh, Egypt and you can see where granular disintegration has occurred. And that's a ruler for scale. There you go, a very simple graphic, but it gives you that rough edge of what we're talking about. And finally, pressure release. This goes back to the days of intrusion. Remember when igneous materials intruded into the rock's crust and then gradually the forces of erosion removed the material to expose the previously unexposed igneous rock? Well, of course, when it was intruded into the rock, it was under a lot of pressure. And gradually that pressure has been released. But the rock, of course, under less pressure, can't just expand slightly, just like you or me, if we had somebody's uh, foot taken off our head. Oh no, it's a plastic. So when it, it wants to expand, because it's now up in the atmospheric pressure, it actually creates um, a tension within the rock and that tension leads to breaking. Of course, in will come water. And if you've got the right kind of environment, an intrusion and a desert environment, oh my lordy lordy, you're gonna get breaking down. Read it if you like, great little word down here, Spalling, and spalling is the name of, of the effect of when layers fall off, not to be confused with sheeting of exfoliation. Okay, moving on from that, oh, sorry, I forgot. I added a diagram because I love to see a longhorn Texan uh, animal on my videos. You could pause me now and read the diagram if you like, but pretty much it's what I've just said. Okay, chemical weathering. Chemical weathering is essentially dissolving, and dissolving is given the name solution. And carbonation, you'll see, is just a specialist form of solution. Okay, so what solution? All rainwater is slightly acidic. It may be carbon dioxide dissolved in it. It may be um, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide. It may be all kinds of nitrous oxides. But essentially, rainwater is slightly acidic. And just like dropping vinegar on your marble chips, you're going to get dissolving taking place with this lovely pitting effect where the, the material has found a line of weakness and gone through. That's solution. Here, in a beautiful uh, pyrite, you can see this can in fact take place on igneous rocks, just as much as sedimentary rocks where the cement is the weakness. Uh, finally, carbonation. So carbonation is simply where calcium-rich sedimentary rocks, in particular, are attacked by acidic rainwater. And the rainwater is acidic. There's your chemical formula. Carbon dioxide plus water gives you H2CO3, which of course is carbonic acid. That carbonic acid attacks calcium carbonate that's the gluing together of the matrix of limestone in particular and in doing that it produces something called calcium bicarbonate and the problem is that calcium bicarbonate is soluble which means it'll wash away where's your rock gone because remember chemical weathering is about the altering of the chemical nature of the rock matrix finally biological weathering Biological weathering is all about physical pressure exerted by things such as roots, and you can see these roots destroying this rock, which looks like a layered kind of, uh, it looks like a limestone, in fact, anyway. Um, and equally, they can accelerate chemical processes. So here's a lichen sitting on a rock, and lichens, of course, will dissolve the rock. Very, very important for you to consider the, two, uh, the biological process separately, but a smart person will think about it. it's just acceleration of chemical and physical processes. Finally, if we look at Louis Peltier's fantastic diagram, what he tried to do here was to plot the world's climatic regions in terms of annual uh, precipitation sorry, and the average temperature. Now, beware with average temperatures, of course, because a desert will have a, a, a very large diurnal temperature range. And where will its average temperature sit? But by and large, what Peltier's diagram tells us is that if it's hot and wet, at which point you want to think about good morning Vietnam, hot and wet. So for example, the Mulu caves of the Sarawak in Indonesia, they are in fact granite, but it's so hot and so wet that you've always got active water 
attacking the rocks there. Remember active water, activation energies from your chemistry experiment. We heat up chemistry experiments to make them work faster. And in fact, if you've got a really warm armpit, the chances are your fungal diseases will get going faster. I think I've said enough. Of course, fatigue processes work where we've got temperatures oscillating around zero degrees. And that's why Peltier determined that in the uh, cooler uh, areas, you'll get a lot more physical activity. Why nothing in here? I hear you ask. Why nothing in there? Well, if you think about it, in very, very cold places, we don't actually get that much associated precipitation. Some of the driest places on the Earth are, in fact, to be found down in Antarctica. Okay, that's Peltier's diagram. And just to show you that I can have the final word, the breaking of, of uh, breakdown of rocks in situ is weathering, and it's to do with the climate plus the rock type will give you the rate and the type of weathering that will dominate. Or put it differently for the mathematicians into house, weathering as a function of climate plus rock type, of course, times by time, because climate doesn't stay constant and rock type pretty much does. That's it. The end of three videos. I hope you've enjoyed them. If you've got any questions, ask your teacher. Thank you very much.